Okay, hey everyone, and thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, anyone who came yesterday, this talk is going to be quite similar in that it's about my personal experiences more than sort of generalised. Though I do actually talk about some general things probably more than I did yesterday, although most of it is based on personal experience. So this is about urban birds and the main birds I'm going to be focusing on this evening are gulls and feral pigeons and underneath I've also written you know other birds you find in cities, corvids, wood pigeons, starlings etc. Obviously there's a lot of birds that you find in cities and towns but the ones that I mainly want to feature tonight are gulls and feral pigeons partly because they're probably the main ones that people think of when you say urban birds but also because they just have such a bad reputation so many people dislike them and the talk or the point of this talk is just to explain why they're actually great and I've got really good personal experiences with both of them. So urban birds generally are often overlooked and they're not seen as mysterious or spectacular and in a lot of the same ways as, as birds that you get in the countryside are. You know people sometimes go to nature reserves or places deep in woodlands to see amazing birds but you don't really hear of anyone saying, oh, I'm going to go out to look at my local pigeon flock today, or I'm going to go out to see the gulls because they're amazing. And they're, caught, they're sort of hidden in plain sight. You know, the familiarity that we have with these birds takes away any mystery because they're easy to see and people are more likely to have run-ins with them and find that they're annoying them or getting in the way or just something about them that they don't like, which they don't have with birds that you don't really see in urban areas as much. So they're never treated as special. And gulls and pigeons are often associated with dirt and disease and there's horrible words surrounding them like rats with wings and they're called dirty and people complain that they get attacked by gulls and things like that so they, they really aren't spoken of in, in a good way and usually if someone's talking about a gull or a pigeon it'll be in a negative sense and the news stories are usually negative so yeah they just don't really have a very good reputation unfortunately so starting off with gulls more specifically First of all, I find that calling gulls seagull actually doesn't help the many species of gulls. So there's about 50 species of gull in reality. And when we call them seagull, what we do is almost, first of all, tar, tar, them, uh, tar them all with the same brush. But secondly, we take away their identity. If, for example, a herring gull swoops someone in a city and takes their food, then that person will say, I got swooped by a seagull. And suddenly every species of gull out there is tarred with the same brush. And the thing is, when you get dogs um, that attack people, it's a certain number of breed of dogs which get a bad rep. You know, there's, there's breeds of dogs which get blamed for being dangerous breeds. And obviously I completely disagree with that. That's completely wrong and it's untrue. But it's even led to legislation surrounding dogs. The thing is though, the reason I think this is significant to mention is that when we blame specific breeds of dogs, that's obviously awful, but it means that when someone hears the word dog, they don't hear negative connotations because dog, as a species is seen as a good species and we have positive um, connotations and experiences with dog. But when seagull is used to describe all gulls, then as soon as one gull species or an individual of a gull species does something bad, then the 50 species of gull in the world are suddenly all the bad ones. And there could even be some out there which have hardly done anything to annoy us. And yet because they're a seagull, we see them as being bad. But in reality, um, about half of the gulls in the world either visit or live in the UK, and some of them are red and amber listed. So the herring gull is red listed, and they had declines of 54% between 1969 and 2002 in the UK. And lesser blackback gulls are amber listed, and lesser blackback gulls and herring gulls are two of the main ones that we see in our cities. And gulls are so different, there's so many different species. They range in uh, weight, for example, between 120 grams and 1.8 kilograms. There's, not su there's no such thing as a seagull, basically. When you say seagull, it takes away their identity. And I wouldn't expect anyone to learn every species of gull. I mean, I don't know every species, but I think it's just something to bear in mind because it's something which makes it easier to dislike them when we view them all as just one and the same, which they're not. But gulls are intelligent, they're resourceful, fiercely protective, they're caring and they're clever. The fact that they've adapted to our towns and cities, people dislike that, but I think it just shows how clever they are, that they use our resources and they're able to exploit these resources and live in a way that works for them close to us. And they've been found to do really clever things. For example, it was found one time that um, girls used to sit in some buildings around the primary school and then at playtime, the children would go outside, eat their snacks, go back in and the girls would come down and eat the food. 
But the girls in this scenario learnt that if the bells didn't ring in the morning and the cars didn't turn up, that meant the children weren't going to be there. So they'd go away and get on with their day rather than waiting for something which wasn't going to happen. And that might not sound very impressive to some people, but I think it just shows that they understand things that maybe we don't give them credit for. Because pigeons and gulls, people often just think they're silly and they don't have brains. And, you know, you've all heard of the term bird brain, but birds are extremely clever. They're caring. Um, they rear their young in nursery flocks, so they get reared in the nest. And then when they get to a certain age, the young go to what's called nursery flocks, often in big fields. And you get adult males that watch over these big flocks. And with herring gulls, it takes about four years for them to reach adulthood. So they spend their time in the flocks until they're ready to go and breed themselves. They're intelligent. Um, gulls have actually been seen fishing with bait. So there's a gull that was seen fishing by dropping breadcrumbs in the water and waiting for a fish to come and eat the breadcrumbs and then they'd catch the fish. And this has actually been seen in more than one case. So yeah, it's just, gulls are, well, I just think they're amazing really. So I've had lots of experiences with gulls, aside from the fact that there's a lot of information about them out there about how they're clever, I've also got personal experiences of knowing gulls. I've seen gulls form friendships with each other. Um, the last World Leaf Rescue Centre I worked at, there were two gulls that were in the aviary. We reared about 120 gull chicks that year. And two of these gulls we called Dino and Lacey. Dino because he was just so much bigger than the other gulls we reared. And Lacey because every time we went into the aviary, she'd peck your laces. And these two were inseparable. There was an aviary of about 50 gulls and you could always tell which two these ones were because they were always together. And Lacey was always coming for your laces, not in an aggressive way, just in an interested, curious way. And um, Dinah would just be with her, usually coming over to say hello as well. I've seen gulls which always hang out with the same gulls, kind of like Dinah and Lacey, and they ward each other off, but not the, the ones they're friends with. So they kind of have their preferences over who they want to be friends with. You see gulls sleeping side by side, preening each other, and just generally showing that they have preferences when it comes to friends. Believe it or not, gulls can be gentle. People see them as these foul beasts that swoop you and steal your food and just attack people and all these horrible things. But if a gull's not scared of you and they don't see you as a threat, then there's not really any reason for them to be so-called aggressive. I've never been bitten by a gull that trusted me. And I have had gulls that have trusted me, whereas I have been bitten by gulls who don't trust me. And it makes complete sense, really. Gulls that have trusted me, I've had eat out of the palm of my hand when they were at an age where it was okay for them to be tame. And they've never hurt me, never injured me, they never pecked aggressively, um, and they were just generally gentle because they didn't see me as a threat. And I'm going to talk a bit about a specific gull who was extremely gentle in a little bit. They're also playful. I've seen gulls, both young and older, have favourite toys. They have their special rock or their special stick that they'll store away and then play with and then put back in their special place and even get jealous of sometimes when another gull wants to play with it. I've seen gulls play with hose pipes. Um, I've even seen a gull, who, again, I'm going to mention shortly, uh, use a hose pipe to fill up an area with water that they wanted to fill up with water. I've seen them play with balls. Um, they love splashing. There was actually a gull once, um, again, a girl who I'm going to mention shortly, who was standing in the middle of a thunderstorm in like a container of water, just looking up at the lightning. And all the other animals were terrified because it was a thunderstorm. But this girl just sat there in the water watching, looking amazed. So they show interest in things as well out with themselves. The reason that girls steal is because they need food. It's not because they're just trying to give you a bad day or anything like that. They probably needed that food more than us, not in all instances, but most of the time, if you've just gone and bought a sandwich and they take it from you, that's not really a big problem for you. But for them, that's a massive meal, which they might even be able to rear their chicks on. And they don't know that in our society, we deem that a criminal, you know, something which people can't do to each other. And yet when we see animals steal things from each other, often we find those things funny. The videos circulate of an animal stealing something from another animal and it's seen as humour. But as soon as we're involved, it's suddenly seen as evil and wicked and the animal should be killed, which is just completely wrong, at least in my opinion. You know, even barn owls sweep people when people get too close to their young. And yet we haven't vilified barn owls because of that. We just see it as a natural protective behaviour. I suppose it's because they're not in our cities, but I don't see why that should really make a difference, especially as we sort of made girls live in our cities by depleting so many of the resources elsewhere. 
Um, I once read a girl as well who had three roommates in a cage with him. And if we ever got too close to the roommates, he'd come and like bite us because he just didn't like us going near to his friends. But if we were clean out the cage away from his friends, he was fine. It was just whenever we got too close to them, I think he was protective over them. And also um, from wildlife rescue experience, I've had adults which actually land on the roof of aviaries of young and they regurgitate, which is how the parents feed their young and so the young can get fed. So they're, they're not the parents of these young, but they fly over and they see the young and they just regurgitate the food for them for some unknown reason. And yet they do this for, for young girls they've never met before. And I'll just go back a sec. So the first girls I ever looked after were called Lucky, Freddie, Patricia and Ashley. Um, Kevin and I used to have what we called a flying school in our garden. So before we actually worked at Wildlife Rescue Centre ourselves, living in Aberdeen, there are a lot of gulls there. So we often found gulls in precarious situations. And, you know, a young gull on the ground doesn't necessarily need to be picked up. It really depends on what's going on around the gull and if there are horrible people around, if it's near a road, things like that. So we did end up with some gulls, but others were okay. It really just depends on a case by case basis. So we ended up having these gulls and eventually would either take them to the local Wildlife Rescue Centre or after a few days when situations were different, they actually managed to be returned to their parents and their parents looked after them as if they hadn't been taken away. It can be dangerous with some birds and you have to make sure that they're definitely back with the right parents, but we 100% knew that it was the right parent and they kept looking after them and we saw them grow up after that, so that was really cool. We also used to have pigeons in our living room and gulls and other seabirds on our bed frame and we would just sleep in our living room um, because we only had a very small one bedroom flat so that's kind of how we started out. So these pictures here are of gulls I have known. I mentioned Weggy briefly yesterday because she was friends with Dora who I was talking about yesterday in my Corva chat. So I'll just go through what I know about these gulls and the experiences I've had with them. So Tracy is one girl that lived on uh, the frame of our bed when we were in that little one bedroom flat. She was with us for maybe a week or so before she went off to the Wildlife Rescue Centre and she lived in a crate. Um, she had a bad wing, but we taught her, or should I say she taught us, to let her out of the cage every morning. And she'd walk from our bedroom through to our bathroom, go into the shower, return the shower on for her, close her in, and then we'd just sit and wait for a little bit until she pecked on the glass of the shower and then we'd open it up and she'd walk back through again. So she had us well trained in making sure that she could get her shower every day. Um, and when she first came into us, she was really nervous. A lot of girls don't like eating captivity, especially if they're on their own. So the first few days she was with us, Kevin actually hand fed her with um, like a big serving spoon. And she'd eat off the spoon, but she wouldn't eat off a bowl until she eventually got a bit more happy with eating captivity. Popeye, um, I can't believe, oh no, there he is. I thought I hadn't included a picture for a minute. There he is sitting on Kevin's shoulder. Popeye was an amazing, amazing girl. I say he was, still is potentially. I've just not seen him in a while. Um, he was unreleasable due to an eye problem. And if you look at the picture, you can possibly see that the eye facing the camera is kind of a bit glazed over. Um, when he was young, he was pecked in the eye. So he had an eye problem for as long as we knew him. And it meant that every single day we had to grab him Kevin usually did it because I'm a bit squeamish when it comes to eyes, but Kevin would have to grab him and medicate his eyes and just be really invasive with his eyes, which is obviously a horrible thing to endure, especially twice a day and when you're so young. And this lasted for quite a few weeks, but because he was um, handled so often and so frequently, he got really tame. And again, with girls, this is usually okay when they're young because as they get older, they wild up really easily as long as you know when to back off. But Popeye had to be kept in captivity because only having one eye, or at least one workable eye, working eye, it meant that he often wasn't very good with distances and he'd crash into things and he was a bit more nervous because I think he knew that it held him back a little bit. He would end up getting free run of the rescue centre just because other than his eye there was nothing wrong with him and he could do a lot of fun things and still really enjoy himself. So he used to follow us around the site and if we went off to do something he'd go and play in the pond um, when we went on holiday, we'd come back after a few days and he'd shout at us and be so angry at us for leaving him. And then over the next few days, he'd slowly forgive us. He talked a lot, so constantly just going, wee, 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 just constant, to the point that anyone in the hospital when he was there just had to leave a lot of the time because they just couldn't think because it was, it really was constant whenever someone else was there. Um, 
he was just he, he was just amazing he would answer when he was called he was just almost like a companion animal he was so tame and he could fly so he would fly around sight a little bit but he never really left very far at all and there are a lot of gulls that lived and I've heard still live on site that just sort of spend all their time there and find all their natural food there and are growing up really well and doing really well. So Elvis in the bottom middle picture there is quite a sad story of Elvis. He came in hit by a car when I think he was only about two months old and he always had pelvic problems after that and he'd kind of be in and out of the hospital, he'd get better and he'd get worse but he seemed stable for a while and we thought he was definitely worth a chance but then unfortunately I was going to say funnily enough, not funny obviously, but it was actually two years ago yesterday on the 17th of December, he just suddenly just wasn't himself. He was always really gentle, he didn't get angry, but one day he just, he just wasn't standing up and there was just something not right. So we brought him into the hospital and I actually had to go away at the time. I can't remember why, but I, I had to go away um, back to Edinburgh or thereabouts, which is where I'm from. And I got a phone call from Kevin when I was in the coach on the way home saying that Elvis had died and he'd just been sitting there and he just looked at uh, the people looking after him and he just suddenly killed over and died. And I got to the cafe at the train station before getting my train back home and I just sat in the cafe and cried on my own and kind of hoped no one would ask what was wrong because I'd have to say a girl died and they probably would have laughed at me. So that was really sad. But he was just amazing as well. And people, I think, don't understand that gulls are all so individual and they're not these horrible beasts that we make them out to be. It's just because most of our interactions with them are negative because that's the only time we really interact with a lot of them is when they're taking our food or fouling near us or something like that. But there's so much more to them than we get to see. And, you know, companion animals like dogs and cats, maybe if they were wild and we never got to associate with them very much, we would maybe have negative opinions of them as well because we wouldn't get to know them and it's the getting to know them which really changes things. I haven't included a picture of Doofus for some reason but Doofus Gull and yeah Doofus, he was called that because first of all he was pretty much the lowest of the pecking order of all gulls like everyone just picked on him but he didn't really seem to care that much he was his own person so I call him Doofus but that doesn't give him credit he was still an amazing gull. But he did silly things. He used to run into the hospital to steal food, which isn't silly, sure, but he did it every day and it was always on cue and it was just so predictable. Um, he would sleep right in the middle of the path on site at night when it's pitch black. So you always had to watch your feet or put on a torch when you're walking around because he'd just be sleeping on the ground while all the other girls had the sense to sleep on a roof or something like that. But one day he decided to move down to the well, which is at the bottom of the field, and we didn't see him after that. He lived there and then he went on his own way, and I reckon he probably did quite well, but it was always easy to spot him because the top of his beak just had a big white line down the middle of it. And that was Doofus Gull. He was quite small and, yeah, definitely the lowest of the pecking order. Then we have Weggy, again, who I mentioned briefly last night. In fact, if I go to the slide before, that's Weggy just there on the right, and you can see that she's got one deformed leg. It was a shame for Weggy. So her, herself and her sibling were both pushed off the roof of a petrol station by a pest controller when they were still nestlings. And her sibling, he had two broken legs, but luckily we were able to um, heal these legs and he left. And Weggy had one bad leg. And we did all we could for the leg, but it ended up staying in the position that you can see. But she actually seemed fine. It didn't hold her back at all. She was able to get into all the food with all the other gulls. And she got released too, and she chose to stay on site, which is the best thing for her. We needed to encourage her to stay because she never struggled, but with one-legged gull, you kind of just want to keep an extra eye on them. And from what I hear, she's still there today. So that's about two and a half years ago. But Weggy was really, I was again, is really gentle. She never got better with her leg. Her leg is still like that today, but she was so gentle with others. Hence why she became friends with Dora, the jackdaw, because she just wasn't imposing. She just let everyone get on with things. Kevin taught her how to do a sort of form of falconry whereby he'd hold food up to her and she'd sweep down and take it gently off his hand. Um, but if you didn't want her to do that, she'd know not to. It wasn't like a girl just sweeping to get food. She actually learned it. Um, one time she was standing on the pond when it was frozen and Kevin rolled up a little snowball and slid it to her and she slid it back and he slid it back and so they played little ice hockey or whatever you'd call it came to each other. Dragon on the bottom right, he was basically the stereotype of a girl. He was big, he was fierce, he was just strong, just everything that I think people think girls are. But 
he was good. He was extremely cheeky. Um, he'd go into the big bucket we had full of bowls that had been washed outside the hospital and he'd just drag them about the place, which is actually why he was called Dragon. First of all, because he kept dragging things, but also because he was huge. So he'd take balls and he'd drag them around and sometimes he'd come out the hospital and find a line of 10 balls and he'd usually be standing at the last one just looking at you as if he expected you to fill up with food. He also had an apprentice who we just called his apprentice and I'll mention that again shortly but he basically just had this uh, apprentice girl follow him around all the time and he'd show him how to do bad things and the apprentice would copy him and he was just training up another girl to be just like him, but this girl was slightly smaller than him, so he obviously wasn't imposing enough for him to find him a problem. He did steal things sometimes and fly away. For example, one time I put a Pringles can in the bin outside and the wind blew out the bin and Dragon picked it up and flew away with it and we never saw it again, so I have no idea what he did with that Pringles can. He was scared of chickens, even though he was a big, just big gull. He and all girls I've ever met have been scared of chickens. We had a lot of chickens and chickens were definitely above gulls in the pecking order. So if a chicken got too near to him, he'd scream at them and then fly away, which is the usual order of things, which is fine because if he wasn't scared of them, it might not have been so good for the chickens. He used to bath in a pond next to the trough of water. So I say trough, it was kind of just a big tray of water, um, probably about that deep. And the girls would usually bathe in it. But he decided to bathe in a little divot in the ground next to it and if there wasn't enough water one time I saw him taking the hose out of the tray and putting it into his not man-made just a girl-made pond to fill it up more so he was resourceful and he was just cheeky as anything and there was always trouble to follow when he was about. DJ top picture he looks huge in comparison to the barn but he's not he was a black-headed girl and he was reared he was the only black-headed girl we reared in 2018 out of the 120 or so and in July he left and he never came back or so we thought until three months later I think it was October he just suddenly appeared again and it's funny the first place he was seen when he came back was one of the hutches where we used to always um, see him before he left so it's like he came back to that particular hutch and he would come get fed stay a few days and then leave again for maybe a week or two weeks and he just kind of in and out whenever he needs us he'd be back Girls in general, I've seen doing silly things. You know, they, they'll try to bath in bowls in a cage. Um, there was one girl who was on some newspaper in a cage and the newspaper had a picture of a roast dinner on it and he tried to eat the mashed potato in the roast dinner. I've seen girls try to bathe themselves on a window, like the caravan that I used to stay in had a skylight and I've seen girls try to bathe themselves in that. And the only girl I've not really mentioned here yet is Dino, the top right. And he was just, actually, no, I did mention Dino Lacey, but I didn't mention him on his own. Um, but yeah, he was just a big girl who went away, tamed, uh, wilded up fine when he was old enough. And um, he was just a really lovely girl. And you can see from the picture, he's really cute, or at least in my opinion, he is. He was a great girl as well. They're all just great girls. That's the take home message. Girls are great. I hope you agree. So this girl I'm about to play a video of, he um, came in, I don't actually know much about him to be honest, um, I don't think he had a name or anything, but he was one of the young ones that came in and he came back into the hospital after the others had gone out to Avery for some reason, I'm not sure what was wrong with him exactly, but he needs to come back in for some TLC. And every day we'd let him out of the cage while we were cleaning and you can tell from the video that we're in the middle of cleaning because it's looking a bit of a mess. And he'd come out and he got so excited about being allowed out of the cage and he'd flap about for a while and just you can just see from the video how excited he is so i'll just play it just now so yeah he was quite a happy girl and you know, we've had girls and pigeons come into us for so many sad reasons, often related to people hating them. I'm not going to say what, because this is a winter warmer, so I don't want to make it miserable, sad, whatever. But you can probably imagine that girls and pigeons come in for a whole array of reasons which aren't nice because of people being horrible to them. And when I look at these girls that I've known, and which I would even say I've been friends with in the past, the thing that really gets me is that I know that if a lot of members of the public saw these exact girls they would think oh they should be called they should be killed and i'm just like you you didn't know them 
And people would think that's a really funny thing to say, but if people saw those exact girls, they would say all the bad things about them, which you hear about girls in general. And I just think that's a huge shame. And I've been so lucky to have a unique opportunity to get to know girls as individuals, which is why I really want other people to know how amazing they are. This is Popeye, and this just shows how he comes when, he call, when he's called and he's just interactive and he loves the pond. Just, just see how nice a girl he is. And also how he talks constantly. Right, so onto feral pigeons. And there's wood pigeons as well in the cities, but I think feral pigeons are the ones that have the worst reputation. So feral pigeons, also known as the rock dove, they were domesticated, so they rely a lot on humans and us feeding them and providing them with their housing. Not intentionally necessarily, but you know, just using our buildings. They're often referred to as rats with wings, which as I demonstrate in this picture here, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Why does rats with wings have to mean a negative connotation at all? Um, I've seen pigeons which are just so brave. They come in with so many horrific injuries and yet they're still willing to fight you, some of them. They're just so resourceful, so hardy, just really, really strong-willed birds. And, you know, they've saved thousands of lives through um, ways they were used in the war. And I think even if you don't agree with that, which is completely understandable, the point is that we're looking at ways of making people like these birds more. And if you can say to people, well, you know, they've saved thousands of human lives. Have you done that? Then maybe that'll make them like pigeons just a little bit more. So my experiences with pigeons. First of all, baby pigeons are really easily tamed. And when they're at yet that, sorry, when they're at that young age, it's okay, just like the girls, you know, they wild up really easily when they go out to the aviary, as long as you don't overdo it. But baby, baby pigeons are so funny because they just squeal constantly, kind of like Popeye, but in their pigeon way, whenever you go towards them, they just flap their wings and squeak at you. And I've got a video um, coming up just to show kind of roughly what it's like. Um, I've seen them feeding each other. So you sometimes get young and they'll actually feed each other, even though that's usually what a parent would do with the young. And pigeons have a really uni unique way of feeding each other where they'll actually um, crop feed each other and they can produce the food all year round. So they breed often all year round, unless it's really cold. They've been seen um, feeding species which do not feed in this way. So the place I used to work before I started working there, someone told me that they actually once saw a pigeon which would pick up bits of, um, I don't know what it was, but pick up some food and would feed a gaping starling with this food, which is absolutely amazing because pigeons don't feed by gaping, but starlings do. So this pigeon learned that it could pick up the food and give it to the starling who was gaping. And this was a way to do it, which just seems, it's just so caring and it's not what you'd expect. And it certainly to me doesn't seem instinctive in the same way as if it then tried to feed the starling by regurgitating. It was almost like some thought had gone into that. Um, they're brave and hardy. They survive all sorts. And as I say, you get pigeons with horrendous injuries come in and they just battle through. They're, <laughs> they're really fun to rear and they'll just fly onto your head and sit on you and squeak and they'll chase you. Um, and it's funny, actually, when I worked up north, I found that maybe one in 10, if even one in 10 pigeons would be I wouldn't want to say aggressive, but when you're cleaning out their cage, it would maybe wing slap you or bite you. Whereas down here near Glasgow, I think it's nine out of 10 pigeons which will bite you and try and attack you if you get too close. So it's funny how geographically there seems to be a, different, a difference in how pigeons behave. So these are some of the pigeons I've had experiences with, and this is just a very small number. Um, Stocky at the bottom, he's not actually a feral pigeon, he's a stock dove, but he features with another pigeon, so that's why I'm mentioning him. So Pidge on the bottom left is the first pigeon I ever looked after, as far as I can recall, and he had the very original name of Pidge, because at the time we didn't know we'd end up getting a lot of pigeons, so we just called him Pidge, because to us he was the one pigeon. And one day when Kevin was in town in Aberdeen, he just found Pidge lying on his back, kicking his legs in the air, and he was just a young one, and everyone was just walking past him, stepping over him, not giving him a second thought. So Obviously, Kevin picked him up and took him home. 
And then we got the Wildlife Rescue Centre that were local to come and pick him up, I think a day later, if that, I think it was the next day actually. Um, he was he was cute. He was unfazed. He was at the sort of age where he just seemed pretty unfazed. Um, he allowed Kevin to hand feed him without too much um, too much problem really, without too much protest. And then after that very short visit we had from a pigeon came Wiggy, and Wiggy stayed with us for a lot longer. So our friends in Aberdeen actually saw a fox with a pigeon in their mouth walking past their house, and. Um, I can't remember exactly why they mentioned it to us, but the next day we went out to look for this pigeon. I think they somehow found out this pigeon had got away from the fox. So they said that there might be an injured pigeon in the area. And we somehow miraculously managed to find this pigeon and we took him home and he had a broken wing and we kept him for a little while until he went to the rescue center as well. But he used to hang out in our flat and he would stay in the cage that you can see him in, in this picture, but we also just let him out and he'd sit on our sofa and just, just hang out with us and I think that was my first longer term experience with the pigeon I just thought they were really amazing and people will see these as dirty creatures and why would you bring one inside your home not least let it sit in your living room which is actually the same room as your kitchen back then but we never had any problems whatsoever with health or anything and I still haven't having done well the rehab for as long as I have I've never gotten ill from an animal or anything like that so Toby Rocket, I think I've got a picture of him on the next slide or the one after that. I've got a few actually, because he was very photogenic. Um, he was found walking the streets in the rain and he was just a young one as well. So he wasn't waterproof and so he needed help. And we had, I think two people who knew found him. One wanted to call him Toby, the other wanted to call him Rocket. So he became Toby Rocket. He used to sit on our windowsill and watch the snow. He loved playing with tissues. He was just a young one. So again, he was quite unfazed. He had the free roam of our house and he just had a good time until again he went to the Wildlife Rescue Centre and I think about a week after he went to the Wildlife Rescue Centre he was just suddenly wild and he hated us which is great but it's funny how they go from being completely happy with you to just hating you and being scared of you which is what you want. He loved looking himself in the mirror, he loved sitting on the TV because the TV used to be warm and he was just a, an all-around good character. Um, and Maggie, who I don't actually think I've included a picture of, Maggie was another young one that came in and she would panic at night, even when she was covered over and it was pitch black, she would just panic. She was quite young and yet, funnily enough, she wasn't calm in the same way as others are, but she would sit on your hand and the only way that she would settle is if she was sitting on your hand, which you actually had to put through the bars of her cage as if you were a perch, but she wasn't interested in any other perches, she just wanted to sit on your hand, bless her. So Charlie on the right, his nickname was BDI. And the reason his nickname was BDI is because he used to sit on the top shelf that was kind of between our kitchen and our living room. And he just looked down at us with one BDI. And he was actually a, racer, a racing pigeon who'd become injured. And so he wasn't phased by us at all. And when he was unwell, he actually quite liked cuddles. So that, that's a picture of me giving him cuddles. And he, was, he would actually fall asleep in your arms. But as he got better, he realized that he'd, he'd taken it too far and he didn't actually want us as friends and he was embarrassed by the way he'd, he'd behaved around us so then he became a lot more distant and a lot more proud again which is great because it means he was getting better. Um, pigeons that are released often fly in a circle I think they're they're kind of looking at the air they've been released they'll fly in a circle once or twice and then they'll, they'll take off and he was actually um, taken to the Wildlife Rescue Centre and he did really well and then we had people you know would, would help with the racing pigeons if they didn't the person who found them didn't want them to um, go back to where they came from because for a lot of racing pigeons once you find out that they can't get to where they're meant to go they're not always interested in them anymore unfortunately. Um, oh that was Stocky when he was found he was found in the chimney um, I'm going to mention Stocky and Sue's just now so Sue's she was a racing pigeon as well. I can't remember her situation. I think she was just found in someone's garden. But the reason she was called Suze was because when the lady who found her dropped her off to us, we were actually in Aberdeen doing a peep show quiz. And one of the characters in peep show is called Big Suze. And she was a big pigeon. So we called her Suze or Big Suze. She was extremely moody. And again, like Charlie, because she was a racer, she wasn't really nervous of us. She was just kind of annoyed at us and looked down on us, which is fair enough. But she came in, I think maybe in like two days before Stocky did. And Stocky being a stock dove, he was very nervous of us. Um, and he was just terrified being with us, but she would comfort him. And they were in separate cages because we didn't really know how they'd react to each other. 
But as soon as he came in, we put his carrier right next to her cage, hoping that maybe he'd have some comfort from the fact there was another um, similar species with him. And she walked right up to him and just lay down and just like put her beak through the bars and just sat there. And I think she was comforting him. And a lot of people would say that that's anthropomorphizing, but that's just what I think. And you can take it as you want. It was funny if we'd get too close to Sue's because she was grumpy, she'd woo at you like in the kind of annoyed noise that the pigeons make. And if you got too near to Stocky, she would also do the same. So it's almost like she was looking out for him. The only time that she didn't act caring of him was when he had fresh food and she'd try and stick her head through the bars and get his food. But I don't think that was necessarily a bad thing. She just wanted some nice food. Um, it's actually a note that Kevin wrote me when I was away and I got back, uh, which just says, warning, if you're standing reading this note, you're within grumpy woo range of Sue's back away slowly, which is very true because she was extremely grumpy and she would woo you no problems at all. In fact, um, I've got a picture coming up which will show the release of Stocky and I'll explain it at the time, but um, Sue's features in the release of Stocky as well because we did release him, he was fine and he got released very close to where he came from not very long afterwards. Another pigeon who doesn't feature here is Karen. These people found Karen the pigeon, again quite a young pigeon, they always seem to be quite young, I think maybe they're more likely to find themselves in predicaments. And this pigeon had extreme canker, also known as trichomoniasis. And it basically means there's really bad lesions in the throat. And Kevin was uh, crop feeding her, so basically putting a tube down her throat because she wasn't old enough yet to know how to self-feed, but also because it's quite good to feed them fluids if they've got canker, especially as like seeds can get lodged in the throat and things like that. But because of the way canker works, when he crop fed her, she actually just brought up a lot of blood and it was, it was so sad, it was so much blood and we thought she was gonna die, but we thought we'll give her a chance. So the um, kind of like the watery mixture that we use to rear pigeons, I put that in a bowl and I just encourage her to drink. And there's a certain way that you can let pigeons who want to feed from their parents drink from a bowl. And if you encourage them enough, some of them will do it. And she did luckily. So she started off drinking that. And then the treatment for the canker set in and then slowly she'd start getting even better and she'd eat really small cockatiel mix seeds and then eventually normal seeds. And then one day she managed to get released because she overcame that. And that was really, really nice. So that's Toby Rocket. I've explained uh, his story, but that's just a few nice pictures of him, him bathing, him, very bad picture, but him playing with the tissue, sitting next to a mirror and the last ones of him watching the snow out of our window. So this on the right hand side is a baby pigeon, not a baby baby because they look a lot more yellow when they're younger, uh, but quite a young one. And on the left is a collar dove that they used to live together. And the way he's acting there is nothing compared to how bigger pigeons act when they just jump all over you and run everywhere and just squeal extremely loudly at you. That's the, the quieter, younger pigeon version. So here's a picture of Kevin and I releasing Stocky, but in the carrier, it's not Stocky, it's actually Sue's, because we figured that Sue's would worry about Stocky if she just saw us grabbing him one day and then he never came back. So we actually took Sue's to the release of Stocky so that she could see exactly what was happening. Um, and she saw that he flew away and then we took her back just so that she wouldn't worry. And uh, that's Charlie on the right, on the bottom picture. And that's kind of an example of why he was called Beady Eyes. So like I did yesterday, if anyone saw my talk yesterday, I thought a good way of illustrating what it's like to live with pigeons is just looking at Facebook posts I did at the time to kind of explain what it was like living with them. So I've got a few here. So this one says, overheard as I get ready to go out, Kevin to Charlie the pigeon. Now I'm gonna let you stay out a bit longer tonight. We'll have a lad's night in where I can paint and you can puku, which is our version, or should I say, our interpretation of the noise that pigeons make. The people on this bus are being treated to a smelly, rustly hedgehog and an angry gull who's pecking noisily at their carrier. Charlie, as always, has been very polite and just enjoying the ride. And that's when we were taking them all to the Wildlife Rescue Centre, in case anyone's wondering. Kevin and I spent half our days with our mattress on the living room floor while a bird lives in our bedroom. It was almost constant over winter, and then a few days ago it was a sparrow, and then the same sparrow and a gull. And now in the evening, we were going to move our mattress back, but an absolutely beautiful pigeon has come in to stay with us for a bit. Usually the pigeons stay in the living room, normally with free run, or should I say flap, during the day. 
But as our mattress is in here already, we may as well stay here and let the pidge have this, his much needed privacy. So we definitely put them before us in that sense. And lastly, this was about Toby Rocket, by the way. When staff members at the supermarket spend 15 minutes looking for a mirror for you after the only one you see is too small and they end up bringing you a £10 great quality mirror, which is plug in with high quality lights for makeup application, but you have to turn the offer down telling them that the mirror is for a pigeon. Now the three of us are celebrating with whiskey or romaine lettuce because Kevin helped as a thousandth client today. In brackets, whiskey for Kevin and the pigeon and lettuce for me, obviously. So I'm going to talk briefly, very briefly about Corvid. Um, and I mainly talked about Corvid yesterday, so that's why it's so brief. Just to, they're common city dwellers, town dwellers. They're known to be intelligent and loyal, and rooks are gentle in captivity. But if you want to know more about Corvids, then when um, the recording of yesterday's talk is posted, you can find it uh, via one kind. Starling, sparrows, and more. So this is my experiences with other city birds that probably have a better reputation. People tend to like these. Although even then there's um, times when people don't like having them like starlings, people complain about starlings and things like that. So even they can have a bad reputation sometimes. So starlings, first of all, they're absolutely hilarious to rear. They don't tweet or gape in a cute sort of way like other birds do. They basically just scream at you until you feed them. And the starling you can see in the bottom middle picture here, even when you'd finished feeding him, he just kept screaming anyway, because I guess he liked the sound of his own voice. <laughs> they, they really do just scream. And anyone who has seen a starling flock can probably attest to the fact that it's just amazing. They're just huge, beautiful flocks, which go through all these different shapes and patterns, and they're really fun to look at. The starling in the picture here seemed to think he was a pigeon. So because of incubator space, sometimes you do have to put in quite different birds, um, quite different birds in with each other into the incubator, as long as it's safe, obviously. So this is a young starling living with three baby pigeons, as you can see. And he definitely just thought that he was a pigeon. So as I say here on my Facebook status again, this starling dude right here has decided he's a pigeon. When the pigeons were separated from the other birds who were putting their beaks down gaping sparrow's throats, they moved in with the most demanding starling in the world. Last night at about eight o'clock, the pigeons were sleeping and I peeked in only to see the starling lying between them on his back with his legs in the air. Starlings don't sleep like that. Panicked, I whipped open the door only for him to flip himself up and run to the door screaming for food. So he's just a weirdo who's decided that to blend him with new friends, he must lie like this. Also, when he's full up, he doesn't stop screaming. He just carries on screaming, but throws away everything that you give him. So he in, indeed was a character, but they're extremely cheeky. Um, sometimes I find when you're sort of trying to wean them off having their food put in their beaks, you put the food in the floor for them, they end up just gaping and screaming at the floor, expecting the food to just jump into their mouths. And one time I thought I could hear a buzzard, but it turned out it was actually a starling mimicking a magpie, mimicking a buzzard. So um, they're just generally quite fun and interesting, and I've had a really good time rearing them. Um, sparrows are another one I've reared, and they're also just fun to rear. They're just really cute in the little squeaks and chirps. Uh, so there's one second from the right, the top picture, and that's a sparrow who I was cleaning out, and I was just holding him as I clean out his cage, and he just decided to jump into my pocket, probably for some warmth, so he was cute. And then the bottom left picture is three nestling starlings, and they're kind of, I call them the starling guards. It looks like they're trying to protect the robin in the middle, the baby robin who was sleeping. So I think he curled into them because it was nice and warm between their beaks. Also with um, not starlings, but missile thrushes and other similar birds to starlings like blackbirds, I've seen ones that are slightly older than other ones actually feeding them. So they'll go down and pick up food and, and feed the younger ones, even though they too are young. So it's kind of like the pigeons. Um, they'll, they'll feed each other even if they're not their parents, they just share a cage together. So the important bit, how to help the perceptions of urban birds. So studies have shown that people are more likely to like animals that are seen as similar to us, phylogenetically, behaviourally and cognitively, which can be related to, which are useful to us, are deemed attractive and admirable and are popular in culture. So this isn't to say that animals have to have any of these qualities in order to deserve to live. But if we want to protect these species or any species, then the best way to do it might be by finding which one of these apply. And basically, if a species 
has traits which mean that they can be talked of in these ways. You know, they're similar to us because X, they can be related to because X are useful to us. And again, it's not that animals should be useful to us, but if you want to change people's opinions and make them value them, then that might be what we have to do. So gulls, just very briefly, they can be anthropomorphized, they mate for life, they're protective of their young, which is seen as a really good trait in humans and yet seems to be frowned on in gulls. And why should gulls know that we're not a threat, considering that a lot of humans actually are a threat to gulls? We see them as a nuisance, but the reason they do what they do and the reason they fit into our lives so well is because they're so intelligent and resourceful. They use cities because we made their original habitat less plentiful, so you could say that we're responsible for them and they're here because of us. Uh, they're clever, they've been seen using bait to fish, which I think is quite smart. They prepare their food to make it safer. So there's a, a food which is seen to be unpalatable and also potentially dangerous to gulls. And they've been seen um, some sort of fish and they've been seen skinning the fish so they eat the insides, which actually isn't unpalatable for them, which I think is quite clever. They drop shells anim shelled animals onto the ground so they can break into them. Um, and actually there was something known as the miracle of the gulls in 1848, where Salt Lake City was so-called plagued uh, by crickets and it meant that their crops failed. Then these gulls moved in and just got rid of the cricket problem. So in Salt Lake City, it's actually known as the miracle of the gulls. And so they're, they're held in quite high esteem there, I believe, or at least so I've heard. These are some beautiful gulls. I haven't really shown ma many very young gulls, so I thought I'd include them. And the gull on the right looks like he's screaming, but he's just talking to us. That's the face they make. And if you ever see a gull yawn, it's one of the best things you'll ever see because their whole mouth just expands, like not just up, but sideways as well. It's just a brilliant sight. <laughs> so pigeons, as I said before, whether you agree with pigeons being used in wars or not, the point is, for me at least, not whether it's okay or not, but that if you can make someone like pigeons by saying that they saved thousands of lives, then that's a really good way to argue their, their point. Uh, one pigeon actually saved over a hundred people in World War II, and pigeons have won awards for doing this for us. And, you know, I say for us, I'm sure they didn't really have a choice, but the point is they've saved people. So maybe we should treat them better just based on that alone, even if it wasn't intentional on their part. They're here because of us. And so they deserve our protection. You know, feral pigeons are descended from domestic pigeons and they're a lot more domestic than their wild counterparts. And so we, we should be looking out for them because it's our fault that they're here. They can, they've been found to differentiate between artists' work. Uh, they've got amazing homing abilities. People say that pigeons are boring and gray, but if you actually look at them, you'll find that there's such a difference between pigeons. I'd say no two look the same, but there's just a lot of difference between them. And there's a picture that coming up shortly, which I think shows this quite well. And like gulls, they're highly sociable and they make for life. Uh, here's a picture, yes. Yeah. So these are four young pigeons. And if you look closely at the picture, you'll see that every single one of those pigeons is, looks different to each other. So apart from the white one, if you had a quick look at them, you might see they all look the same, but actually their feather patterns are all different from one another. And corvids, again, this is more brief because I did a whole talk on corvids yesterday, but they're considered to be some of the most intelligent animals on the planet, not just birds, but animals. They can pass some tests that even children up to about the age of seven can't pass. And again, highly sociable, they make for life. They've been found to hold grudges and pass them on to other corvids, which is something I explained yesterday. They've been found to give gifts to humans that feed them. And as you can see from this picture down here, they uh, like to go sledging. 